Good morning, everybody. This is Tom from New York. We'll start out from uh, with a quote from Ms. Hoiney. So, the significance of this building, and she's speaking of the extension of the Mother Church, is not to be found in the material structure, but in the lives of those who, under the consecrated leadership of Mrs. Eddy, and following her example, are doing the works which Jesus said should mark the lives of his followers. It stands as the visible symbol of a religion which heals the sick and reforms the sinful as our master healed and reformed them. It proclaims to the world that Jesus' gospel was for all time and for all men, that it is as effective today as it was when he preached the word of God to the multitudes in Judea and healed them of their diseases and their sins. It speaks for the successful labors of one divinely guided woman who has brought to the world the spiritual understanding of the scriptures and whose ministry has revealed the one true science and changed the whole aspect of medicine and theology. Thank you. Wonderful. Can I make a comment about that? Yes, please. This reminded me of a conversation we had a few weeks back about is it important or not that we preserve some of these places where uh, are kind of like our spiritual histories recorded, places in the Holy Land and places here, like what we're talking about here, this significance of this building, the extension of the Mother Church. And I think the discussion kind of went the direction where of do we really need these places? Are they important in themselves? And I think this speaks to that, that um, they are a visible symbol of what our religion stands for. It's preserving our spiritual history. We don't worship places and things, but wouldn't evil love us to wipe this off the face of the earth? Anything connected with our spiritual history, anything about the life of Jesus or Mary Baker Eddy? And so like future generations, are they gonna say that the stories in the Bible aren't true because there's no evidence of these places ever actually having existed? And we hear this very kind of thing now. So I'm in favor of preserving them and uh, I'd much rather see them stand there than be torn down and replaced with a high rise or a condo. Thank you, Sana. Absolutely. I agree a hundred percent. It is it is it's the, the symbol of it. And if you read the beginning of miscellany, it goes into the symbol of of the edifice, all the all of it. And Mrs. Eddy was behind it, even though she never entered it. She she had to have been behind it, and she was at that time. It's not the end all be all. No, and we can live without it. But it, it symbolizes something tremendous, tremendous love of God. And uh, anyway, I, I do agree with that. And that's why I'm so grateful for long years. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. But everyone, you know, to each his own, not everyone might feel that way. And as I said, you can go on without the symbols, but to me, they ha they're rich in meaning, so. And as a society, it's important that we preserve the things that are the foundation of our society. And if something like this is not the foundation of our society, we don't have a society, quite frankly. <laughs> and you know, it's one of the first things a so-called enemy will destroy. Any Anything that would uh, refer you back to God or you know, Mrs. Eddy, in our case, that's what they're out to destroy that. They are. They don't want those symbols. They will blow them up if possible. And we live in a visible world at this point. And, I mean, other churches have visibility. The Catholic certainly does. Yes. Yeah, so it shows us, it shows our presence. Our presence. Mm -hmm. I'm only Good. speaking for me, but I'm just thinking about, you know, if I went around my day-to-day -day and I didn't have something to remind me now and then, 
I could drift off very quickly and easily. So the symbol serves a purpose. The symbol isn't God, but it does serve a purpose to remind us of something of God. Yes. Um, I told a few of this story, but it, you know, because it, it was a, it was a dream I had, but it was along these lines where I, we were, were driving out somewhere in the country, and I always I do always love even to see those the white little white steeples, the churches, and but this time there was this huge huge black building, and uh, I, I was convulsed by it. I had to pull up where I could stop the car. And it was, it was a, a something worshiping Satan. And it was a very, one of those vivid dreams that you remember and you wake up and it's like I was in a state of, uh, well, soberness, I guess, and other things. But I really did work to correct that. And believe me, if we take away all our Christian symbols, there will be other symbols that will rise up. So... Uh, let us be mindful of that as well. And the, to me, that was the message that I felt I was getting from, from God, that, you know, don't let those symbols rise up. They would be laughing at us if we're destroying our Christian symbols and thinking they're no longer worthwhile. Uh, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and so while they're ready to uh, erect their symbols, so just as they did in biblical times, these false gods, so anyway, I thought it was a wonderful quote from Tom, and thank you, and maybe we will put it yeah. on the carousel. Another thought is that we're to evangelize the human. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I picked this quote, it, it speaks here of following Mary Baker Eddy's example um, in doing the works of Jesus uh, which marked the lives of his followers. So um, the questions uh, kind of relate to that. Um, the quote in the lesson that sort of stood out to me, uh, that got me thinking about the questions, I'll read to you. So in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Um, so now uh, we, we have we have some text that we were to read for today. It's not all that much, so I thought it might be interesting um, and, and just uh, make sure people feel included and get an opportunity to speak if uh, we had uh, people who would read the uh, selections here. So if there's someone who would like to read Psalm 14, verse 1, I'll read it. Yes, please. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Thank you. Um, and then Psalm 16, verse 8. I said I'll read it okay I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved thank you thank you um, and then Mark 9 verse 9 Mark 9 and as yes. they came down yes. from the mountain he them that they should tell no man what things they had seen so the son of man were risen from the dead thank you um, and then we'll go to the glossary of science and health so um, page uh, 580 so it's going to be the last paragraph of uh, the definition of Adam we'll start I have out. That one. did you want to read yes please the name Adam re represents the false supposition that life is not eternal, but has beginning and end, that the infinite enters finite, that intelligence passes into non-intelligence, and that soul dwells in material sense. That immortal mind results in matter, 
and matter in mortal mind, that the one God and creator entered what he created and then disappeared in the atheism of matter. Thank you. Um, all right, and then page 583, lines 10 and 11. I'll read. Thank you. <coughs> The Christ, the divine manifestation of God, which comes to the flesh to destroy incarnate error. Oh, thank you. The next one, if you want. Go ahead, please. Okay, and then give me one. At man, the compound idea of infinite spirit, the spiritual image and likeness of God, the full representation of mind. Great. Well, since you last read, do you want to start out first? First question. Go ahead. Um, After all, the last shall be first. (laughs) (laughs) The Adam question? Uh, Compare, so the first question is compare the definition of Adam to the definitions of Christ and man. Well, the co- comparison is absolute opposite. One, the Adam co- uh, definition is a false proposition that life is not eternal. It is material. And of course, the Christ definition is saying that infinity the divine manifestation of God, which comes to the flesh to destroy that incarnate error. So, um, I mean, they just cannot dwell together. One is the exact opposite of the other. One is supreme, which is a Christ. What is a supposition? The opposite. Uh, it's, 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 a, like it's, a a, it's a belief or a premise without proof. It doesn't have anything behind it. No law, no substance. Yes, yeah, right. thank you. Yes. yes, it's as if you were supposing something. You're supposing something, but you have no evidence. You're just kind of making it up, which is what Adam is. It's made up. I thought the I thought the comparison was you know was thinking about it was very telling because the definition of Adam is the belief that somehow matter and spirit commingle somehow they exist together in the same place that one turns into the other or one creates the other, that somehow they can exist in the same person or the same thing. And it leads to nothing but confusion and wrong conclusions and unhappiness. Whereas Christ is strictly the spirit of God coming to man to destroy that false belief, as Lawrence Wells said. And man, the definition of man, is something totally spiritual. That there's no matter involved there. The real man. Yeah. <laughs> and this this you know, this, one of the things that Christian science, the reason Christian science is so revolutionary and the reason Jesus was, you know, killed was because they taught that matter is unreal. And that's just, that's something that enrages the human mind. <laughs> And it's also something that most people will flatly deny at the outset. And it's something that, quite frankly, it's it's difficult to grasp 
been to get to live with. Yet if you go far enough into quantum physics, matter has been disproved. That's one of the things that Einstein realized, that there was no such thing as matter. That's why he had such respect for Mrs. Eddy, uh, because she came upon it in a far different way. But, and that's why she says the study of academics, the right kind of academics, is good. It will lead you out of all these false beliefs because there is only one truth, and it will become evident. You just don't stop halfway, though. You have to keep keep going, as Einstein did and others. You don't even have to go to quantum physics. Even like basic physics says that every there's no nothing is solid. It's just atoms dancing around. Yes. Mm-hmm. What's on you? Well, personal sense can't take the truth. Personal sense can't stand it. I found it interesting that Mrs. Eddy had two comments on the Bible passage for as in, from 1 Corinthians 15.22 For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And she uh, restated that in Science and Health as, as Adam, error, all die, even so in Christ, truth, shall all be made alive. And she went on to uh, discuss it about the mortality of man is a myth, for man is immortal. And she did the similar uh, comment in miscellaneous uh, writings on page 79. Thank you. Well, I think that's excellent. I mean, that really shows that uh, um, she read and understood and and she wrote based on what she read in the Bible. It wasn't some philosopher. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, And and she, she stated metaphysics is above physics. And she she got that clearly through a revelation. Einstein kind of came to that conclusion by studying physics <laughs> and by by having a state of thought that was above what he was studying. And he was he was he was kind of a rebellious thought, <laughs> which enabled him to grasp the metaphysics of what he was studying. Um, so I also wanted to uh, bring up, because um, we had some Bible texts that kind of went along with this. So if you read in uh, the glossary, it's just sort of um, uh, paraphrasing this, but it you know it talks about Adam uh, and in essence representing the atheism of matter. So one of the uh, uh, verses we wrote, you know, Psalm 14, it says, "The fool has said in his heart, there is no God." You know, Are we fools? Yeah. That's the Adam dream. If we go along with that, we are fools. You know, the human mind gets enamored with effect and has no regard for cause. So it sees itself walking around with his body thinking, oh, aren't I great? I did it all on my own. And the whole thing is mistaken from the beginning, from that premise, because it's absent God. And it involves all this competition. Yes. Yeah. And worse. All, all the evils of the carnal mind. So, in, in speaking of the fool, <laughs> and the second question, um, how does one know they are following Adam? Um, so, now, uh, you, you can treat that question kind of loosely because um, I'm sure none of us um, go around following Adam. But, um, <laughs> um but, you know, are, are there things that we're doing where we're, uh, um, you know, um, not, you know, um, following after Christ or, or we're not thinking of God? Like, um, how do we know this? And, like, what do we do as we go about our day? And as you think of responding to this, if you can think of um, maybe some examples that are in the Bible lesson this week would be helpful, too. Thanks. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I think a big one is uh, getting into personality and seeing people as a lot of millions of personalities, divided interests. Very good. Mm-hmm. So one of the things in that verse that says not doing anyone any good made me think of the word selfish. In other words, you're only doing what you want to do instead of what God yes. wants you to do. Yes. I remember reading in Genesis when the Lord called and Adam was afraid and hid himself because he thought he was naked. So what kind of mentality is afraid at the voice of God, one that's self-centered? And uh, I forgot who said it, based on selfishness, that's all it is. So to answer Tom's question, how do you know if you're following Adam? I think my response would be, if you look within, and you find that you're fully yourself, if you look within. I think a lot of people follow Adam and and aren't aware of it. Absolutely. Because, because, because if uh, they're afraid, if if, if of what they'll see, yeah, if, if we are awake, actually aware of it, we might not do it so much. <laughs> yeah, and people are aiming for worldly success and worldly goods, and they think they're you know they they're achieving. But, well, and and Bruce said, if you're full of fear, that shows you're following Adam. That's a big one, and most people don't recognize it. But you are. If you're full of fear, you're following Adam. You 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 don't believe in God. That's why you're so afraid. I mean, that's what it gets down to. So if you're feeling fearful, get to the bottom of it right away. Don't let it drive you. Stop. What are you afraid of? Take a look at it. Handle it. Deal with it. Otherwise, it will just be chronic, and you don't need to live in chronic fear. I read a story about this. Man, after World War II, he was a Japanese man. He lived in a cave for I don't know how many years, 20 years, because he was so afraid of Americans and that something might happen to him. So he lived in this cave in total fear, and yet there was nothing more to be afraid of. But we, So we do it to ourselves with these fears we have, unfaced and unchallenged. And then it makes us afraid to trust God, the very thing we need. Yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, it was helpful to me once when uh, uh, our, our teacher, Mrs. Evans, said that fear is usually disobedient, the result of disobedient. So, and that goes to the question, are you obeying the Adam dream or are you obeying God? And if you're not obeying God, you're going to feel fearful. Yeah, and, and rightly so. <laughs> And, and it's, a, it's a good thing because it's a wake-up call to change direction. One way to think about it is if you put an I in front of something, like I think or I will or I'm going to do it, then it's not coming from God, and that's coming from the Adam dream. Mm-hmm. Good, thank you. If you don't feel humility all, all the time, that's an indication that something's wrong. You're not giving credit to God. Absolutely. Another sign is if I feel frustrated. If I feel frustrated, it shows that I'm willfully trying to do something. Yeah, and you're hitting your head against the wall. And the other, which is a really good one to catch, is negativity. If everything, oh my gosh, the world's coming apart, no... Everything's just awful. It's really easy to slip into that in a self-righteous sense. If you're in that, then you're in the wrong mind. You're in the Adam dream. Watch it, and watch it in others. You don't want to surround yourself with a doomsday. Everything is wrong. Eeyore <laughs> and Winnie the Pooh. Uh-huh. I think it's going to rain. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you think you can do something without asking God, oh, I know how to do this, and you go ahead and do it the following. The Adam dream. Yep, that's the pride. Like another sign. About dishonesty. Sorry. Yeah. That's a good one. Go ahead, Lynn. Sure. Talk about Well, that's it. I was just leaving it at dishonesty. That's a big one, I think. 
Yeah. Think think of it. If you start feeling you've got to cover your tracks or lie about anything, you're in trouble. You're in the Adam dream. Don't go there. Donna and um, Tom sent me this really interesting book. What's the name of it? About the... Oh, it's uh, uh, from the Methodist pulpit, I think it's called. Okay. Christian Scientist. Um, oh, yeah. From the Methodist pulpit into Christian Science. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and it just comes to mind because I've just started reading some of it, but the beginning of it talks about his early roots in, in a Christian home where he was taught honesty. You would see it with his father. You know, everything he did was honest. If they accidentally... Uh, bought something they hadn't paid for, he took it back. But it was this sense of, of honesty and all of the qualities that we were talking about. Uh, and also the one Sharon just mentioned, asking God to for help in, in everything he did. He saw that, he saw examples of that where when people did it. For instance, his mother became ill and he went in his room and got on his knees and prayed for his mother and his mother felt better. And he said, wow, this really works. So he, he just started to do it all the time, made it a way of his life. Keeps you out of the Adam dream. Quite a story. Thank you for sending it to me. It's a, it's a book worth reading. I've read it before, how he even dealt with the supply, you know, yes, he, supplies. Yeah. And I mean, it's a great way. He really did a great job. With it. He did. The end of the book is... And yeah. not just supply, abundant supply. Mm -hmm. And and as a Christian scientist, you should have abundant supply. Your father is an abundant God. And many times people think that's some evil. It's only evil if you use it selfishly and you fall asleep and go back to the Adam dream. Then it's evil. Or if you have a huge excess of it, that's obscene. Um, you should have it to use help the cause or others to tie to give back not necessarily evil unless you use it for selfish purposes and even so-called Christian scientists have fallen into that trap so thank you for mentioning that and the name of the book is uh, Out of the Methodist Pulpit into Christian Science and it's by uh, funny, it? uh, she's Norwegian a Simeon yes. Uh, uh, Reverend Simonson. Simonson. And it is, I did look it up. There are a few copies on Amazon of it. We, we could publish parts of it, you know, or, or use it in one or, excuse me, liberate. <laughs> we, I think we can use it for things like that. So, okay, let's go on. Okay, so next question. So, well, uh, there's still ahead, a couple please. of other things that oh, came sure. to me. Uh, you know, because we don't always know that we're doing this. You know, when we do, when we are dishonest, or when we are afraid, or whatever. But one of the another sign uh, that I'm following Adam is if I ever feel like I'm being insulted, if I if I if I actually take mm. offense, if I'm offended, or if I'm insulted. That's a sign. But that's not being unself. Well, and it's a sign that I'm wrapped up in myself, right, following Adam. And it's a sign you're not open to change and rebuke sometimes, which we'll get into the next question. And before we leave that question, it's, it's in this week's lesson, part of a good part of the answer. If you are too material to love the science of mind and are satisfied with good words instead of effects, if you adhere to error and are afraid to trust truth, the question then recurs, Adam, where art thou? Okay, so um, question two was um, kind of about um, how we recognize when uh, we're not following Christ. So, question three. Yes, I know. Yeah. So two was about how we, how do we recognize when we're not following Christ? But uh, three though is kind of the other direction is uh, what do we need to do to follow Christ? 
love one another as ourselves. Be humble and obey. Thank you. Be honest. Find God's purpose for us. Yes. Yeah. Page seven from the Bible lesson, Matthew. And we are to um, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers. And to go cheerfully about our work. Yes, yeah, cheerfully. So is anybody doing that? <laughs> <laughs> we sure are. Yes, so, step in many cases in the Bible, Jesus offered some questions being presented to him. He would tell them, go and do likewise. He said that in few times. Go and do likewise. Um, I think today it's easy to say I'm a Christian or a Christian scientist. Jesus told us many times to go and do likewise. I mean, there's no other way you can follow Christ than to examine the life that Jesus lived and do likewise. Not a little bit, everything that he did. And that, by studying it, you can call yourself a Christian or a Christian scientist. But it breaks my heart sometimes. Um, when you see some people who call themselves Christian, you see all the time, or even Christian sciences. Um, even what Jesus did, if Jesus is here today, we probably will not look at my Jesus. That's very true. Well, there's one thing that came to me in answer to this question. What does one need to do to follow Christ? You know, I think about Jesus' example. He did nothing without the Father. And many times he said, the Father is with me. And the thing that came to me was, I have to feel the power and presence of God here with me and everyone else. That'd be kind of a general statement, but I think it's something that Got to give every day. That's a good point because Thanksgiving precedes a good work or a good outcome. There's the I think thing you have to have the desire too, though. Desire to leave the false landmarks, Thank put you. off the old man. Because Thank you. sometimes it usually happens by suffering, but uh, you find it's a dead end, and then you can't go anywhere. So save or I perish. Thank you so much. That's that's the beginning of it, is the desire to do it. Thank you, Elizabeth. You have to have that desire. It's either in you or you get it from suffering or whatever, but you have to have it. You have to yearn. You have to want it more than anything else. And then you have to have the moral courage to actually do what God tells you to do. Because it's often a very uncomfortable thing to do. Especially in the beginning, when it's contrary to the life you've been leading. And you have to start changing things, changing yourself first, of course. I thought some of these, I found some things, this is miscellaneous writing. Uh, to love and to be loved, one must do good to others. The inevitable condition whereby to become blessed is to bless others. But here you must so know yourself under God's direction that you do, that you will do His will, even though your pearls be down, downtrodden. Oft times the rod is His means of grace, then it must be ours. We cannot avoid wielding it if we reflect him. So, first, yes, you come under his rod. You do. You come under his rod. You begin, you know, things won't go right if you're not obeying him. Uh, and then you learn by that. You should learn from your experiences. This is how you get out of this false sense of the Adam dream. 
by some suffering, by learning from your experiences. Nobody likes to hit their head against the wall. If you, if you continue to disobey that, eventually you'll come up with a cropper of a problem. And then you really have to, as Elizabeth said, save or I perish. But then after that, you have to be willing to, to wield the rod. <laughs> that, this is the definition of Christ with the strong incarnate era. It's certainly the definition of Jesus rebuking. Uh, you, you have to be strong. You've got to rebuke the era. If you're going to be in the Christ mind, you've got to have that. That's the power behind it. You can't be some nice little lady or man or mealy mouth person. You've got to have that strength to rebuke the era first in your own thought and then in others if need be. That's being the Christ example. And, and sometimes that will put you against opposition and uncomfortableness, as Gary said, but it must be done. And Mrs. Eddie warns us, she says, if you're going to be a Christian scientist, you're, in, you're actually enlisting in, in an army. I mean, it's not a direct quote, but she does use the word enlist. So you got to be prepared to do battle with error, not with people, but with error. And when people get upset about it, well, you know, you got to be willing to take that. And and another sign, as I think Gary mentioned it, is you you have to be able to take correction. In Proverbs 15, it says, "The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that re refi refuseth instruction despises his own soul. But he that heareth reproof." Getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. You've got to be humble enough to take correction. You just do. If you go into a tailspin anytime anyone tells you anything, you got to get over that. You won't learn. You're damning yourself. And even if that person is wrong, what he's saying, you, you accept it, you learn what you can. If, if, as Mrs. Eddy said, if there's any truth to it, I accept it and take it. And if not, I water off a duck's back. That's my quote, paraphrase. He says he just drops it. Just drop it, yes. Don't go on and on with it. Just drop it and move on. But in that chapter on loving your enemies, she will say that too. I have quotes from that today too. But she says that you're better off with enemies. You're better off with people pointing things out and, and, and trials and things to meet than you are with just a la-di-da la life where everyone's loving you. Better to have a little correction and a little opposition. You grow with that. The others will put you to sleep if you're not careful. But the other is not real love anyway. It isn't. Thank I, you. It is not. Oh, can I say something about that? Please do. Um, I just went through a, a really rough two weeks, and uh, I, I really appreciate the correction that I got. And even though I was still struggling with it, it it's like I knew inside that I had, you know, I could recognize the fear of being disobedient to God, and I knew where I wanted to be, but it, it's like, you almost feel like you're like two separate people, like, your mouth is saying stuff that you don't even really feel is right, but you don't know how to really stop it from happening. You, your desire is to be obedient to God and all this stuff, but you have so much coming out that you know needs correcting, and really it's really difficult at the time that it's happening but you know like somebody said before you, you don't even, you don't even know that that's inside of you you know and then when you're faced when it's met with the truth it does stir you up it, and even though you know the truth is, is the right side it's really hard to break free from that but yeah I do understand it now, and it, it's a great blessing to be able to understand it and to come through it. But it does bring you places you really don't want to go. 
Thank and that's the sign of a really good worker. Thank you. That you're willing yeah. to go through the very, very uncomfortable experience of getting the air up and out and parting with it. it. It is often a very painful experience, but if you're willing to do it and you do it faithfully, God, God will take you to a much better place than you have ever been before. Thank you. Well, but I, I knew that, and I had all kinds of things telling me, you know, don't don't bother calling in for the Bible study. Don't don't bother. And I, I knew I had a personal sense of, of this problem that was happening, and I knew I had to break away from it. So I did whatever it took just to dial the number and to call in and to make sure that I was getting the truth on top of the truth on top of the truth because I knew eventually I could get to a place but it, it's difficult when you're in such a place of you know mortal mind that you just I don't know it's an awful warfare and, and you really want what's right mm -hmm. I really appreciate the the stern truth I received, and it's brought me to a much better place. That is, and the fact you can speak about it shows you really are over it now. Because if you weren't, you, you'd be too prideful to talk about it. And because of that, you've blessed many others. Um, yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Luann. Yeah. Thank you all for being there. Just watches and, and praying and everything that everybody does is, is a great blessing to a lot of people who are struggling with things. Luann, others have <clears throat> had to step through that too in years past. And it, it is good on the other. Uh, once you can see who you really are, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll, you'll, you'll be blessed. <clears throat> Yeah, and I don't know ever go ahead. Ever passed it, you know, there are always struggles and things as long as we're on this earth. So, uh, we do come under the rod of God and sometimes others reaching out to help us might say things that sting. But if you can take it in good grace and keep going as Luann did and not take your marbles and leave or or, you know, go in a huff, <laughs> the blessings are just incredible. This is called faithfulness faithfulness to God, not to person, but to God. Go ahead, Linda. I had to fight through well, a lot I, of suggestions. Oh, Luann? Yeah, I, I was just saying that I had to fight through a lot of suggestions at that time. and, and it's just, it's, Yeah, the it's, devil doesn't like to give up easily, does it? No, it didn't give up very easy at all. No. And it's only because you're worthwhile. If you weren't worthwhile, it would leave you alone. But when you're worthwhile, it'll try all the more. So if you're under a mighty struggle, know that it's worth it, worth fighting and come to come through it. Because he doesn't want your testimony to be spoken to others. It wants to shut you down and take you out. If it can't do that, an era is howled and howled. It has done nothing, as Mrs. Eddy said. So, Linda, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to express my appreciation of all the people that do speak out on this topic. And I think it's also been called the ring of fire, because if you didn't really understand this, it just would be mind-boggling, and, and you probably would turn away. And uh, so it's very helpful when people speak openly, and especially the seasoned workers who've been through this, too. It's very encouraging and helpful to help you face it. Absolutely, and that is the ring of fire, and and it is because first, and Mrs. Eddie will talk about it first. What it's it's sweet, it's sweet, and then things become bitter. Um, you know, I was there was something in retrospection and introspection that she speaks to that about, uh, and I, I don't have the page number, but. Anyone looks it up rod under retrospection and introspection. Anyway, she talks about that the lambs are gathered gently, but then the sheep have to come under under the rod, and and maybe you don't want to pass under that rod, but uh, you need to. Don't don't stray. Don't <laughs> come under it. 
because as I said then, that's when the blessings come and that's when you grow and you ascend in the scale of being. It gets you out of this false belief of the Adam dream. And remember too, there are not two of you. There's not the Adam man and the good God man. There's the one man. And we're just dropping off false beliefs. This is why, why uh, ways that are vain was yeah. important to me because it really shows you how how fake, how what a lie these lying, humanly uh, justifiable suggestions are. It's just something using. It's not true at all, and it it doesn't even have any power. But I'm so grateful for Mrs. Letty for ways that are vain, really. Thank you, Brian. Um, if I can ask something, um, doesn't phone in cars also, if not all the time, mean giving up something? It could be, like you want to say, um, giving up the past or giving up something. Even though that could be something, in, in some cases, in some instances, it could be something that means so much to you something of value. Um, like in his disciples, all the disciples that he called when his mission began, they gave up a lot to follow Christ. Some gave up their business, which we are very successful. Um, um, what is that? Peter you know, and the time of John and his brother were actually very successful business men. Um, and they gave it up full of Christ, and um, you don't know what it actually means to give up something. Yeah, and it's always it's always the false sense, the personal sense of things. Um, Kimball, and I read this just recently, I don't remember where, but he, he talked about, went up to Mrs. Eddy and said how he was going to give up this, that, and the next thing. And, and she said directly, all you have to give up is sin, disease, and death, or something like that. But, but that's what you give up. Because many people think that this is, oh, you just you know, have to become a monk in a monastery. You don't. Your life should be more joyous, more full, more wonderful, buoyant, everything. Your relationships, richer, better. All of these things. What you give up is the personal sense of it that's damning and that there's a life apart from God. But life in God is not living in a monastery and, and drinking water and crackers. <laughs> on, this, on the other hand, it's not, you know, living in a huge mansion as Dive did, right? Dive? Dive, yes. Dive. Yeah. Well, hating or, you know, not Ignoring caring about your yeah. fellow man. So, so what you give up are your false beliefs in a life apart from God. Um, I, 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 I'm and that brings back to me to say this on what when she said lost it again. You're not actually losing anything. You're not actually losing anything at all. Yeah. <laughs> because you're actually getting more. Yeah, you're required, you're required yeah. to give up those things that you treasure yeah. more than God. Yeah. You, that's what you have to give up. And I, the... This, the, the, the thing that Mary was uh, talking about earlier is actually in Revelation where it talks about the little book. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, the angel said to, um, you know, take it and eat it up. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was, in my mouth it was sweet as honey. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So as we enter into this warfare with evil, there will be times that will seem bitter. But there but, will be times. But but the the you know, and she says the warfare with oneself, you know, is grand. So um, just want to say we. Um, Effectively transition to question four. We talked about some of the difficulties. Um, was there anybody that wanted to bring up anything on the, um, what to do with difficulties uh, following Christ? Uh, or we move on to the next one? 
I, I will. I just did want to read what is in retrospection and introspection, which which does apply to this on page 80. Ad, admonition. Though the divine rebuke is effectual to the pulling down of sin's strongholds, it may stir the human heart to resist truth before this heart becomes obediently receptive of the heavenly discipline. That's what Luann was talking about. If the Christian scientists recognize the mingled sternness and gentleness which permeate justice and love, he will not scorn the timely reproof but will so absorb it that this warning will be within him a spring, welling up unto, into unceasing spiritual rise and progress. Patience and obedience with, win the golden scholarship of experimental tuition. And then the kindly shepherd of the East carries his lambs in his arms to the sheep's cot. But the older sheep must pass into the fold under his compelling rod. He who sees the door and turns away from it is guilty, while innocence strayeth yearningly. The wonderful two paragraphs to live with. So okay. that's when you have difficulties. Remember this. Remember not to, not to, you're guilty if you stray, if you don't come under the rod, and you will suffer more anguish until you finally have it burned out of you. And I have found, in answer to question number four, when there's difficulty following Christ, what I find helpful is if I just sit down and ask God, what I can do for someone else to show me the need around me. Freely ye have received, freely give. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Get out of myself and ask God who needs something that I can offer. And self-love, receiving directly the divine power. It lifts you up and out. Well, I feel... That way, um, you know, when there's a difficulty, it seems a, a looming, a, a big problem, and I may fall away in some way. I, I often just turn to God as Father. I just say, Father, help me. Father, help me. Thank you. Right, and, it, and, that, and that's an important first step. Yeah. yeah, connecting and, yourself to yeah. God. And then, what can you do for someone else? What, yes, and, yes, and what can you really do for someone else? Because it wants to keep you in that selfish mode of how hard this path is. The other thing I do, just remember what went before you, the sacrifices made before you. What any of us are being asked here is far less than the Christ Jesus, Mary Baker Eddy, those who founded our freedom in our country, all of those sacrifices. We're not being asked to do that. So don't don't grumble and complain when the way gets tough. But rejoice, but it's the him. I will follow and rejoice all the rugged way. Also every difficulty that you overcome is a great opportunity to for growth. Difficulties don't usually come, but it's not. It's usually an opportunity for us. If we look on the list, the opportunity for good, we can overcome them. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, when you've overcome something, you're in a different place. It, it, it doesn't leave you where it found you. Demand the blessing. That is the truth of every challenge. It's an opportunity for growth. So we need to see it in that light. Otherwise, we fall into the complaining. Yeah. That's no good. That'll get you nowhere fast. Okay, so um, our last question. <clears throat> what are the obligations of the members of a church when another member is struggling to follow Christ? Is that a trick question? <laughs> 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 I 
I don't think it is. No, uh, it's more of an open, <laughs> open question. Well, you tell them you shouldn't do that. You're wrong and bad, right? We have heard that line. <laughs> Throw Bible quotes and science quotes from science and health at them. Yeah. Oh, excellent! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just made me grateful for this good church where we support each other. Well, there's one thing you don't do. Gossip. You, you don't judge. Yeah. Don't do that. You, you wrap them in God's love. And you give a timely rebuke if needed, if needed. Um, but what's so wonderful in our church here, I mean, all, all of this discussion, this is helping. You know, what Luann said would be helping someone struggling. This is why we come together and, and speak so honestly. This is what our Wednesday meeting should be about. That's how we mm -hmm. help and encourage we all speak to it in various ways, coming from our own experience. The thought that comes to my mind is about the people that uh, physically attend the church here online. It's a little bit different situation. Everyone seems to be welcome, and the struggle is not obvious to other people. But when you attend a church, if you're having a struggle, say, with mobility, and you don't want to go because you feel like you are not a successful Christian scientist and that the members will not um, see you correctly. And so the obligation of the members is to make sure that those that are struggling do come and whatever their state of, of struggle is so that they can know that they're not alone. Thank you. And I would just like to say, if someone is struggling with a physical problem, that does not necessarily mean that they're struggling to follow Christ. Exactly. They may, be, they may be doing a much better job of following Christ than those that don't have a physical problem at the moment. Yeah. And, and let's sort of dispense with the CS boss and stuff. I mean, I had a neighbor two years ago um, uh, I got along with her really well, and so one day, though, she started going around with a walker, and when I saw her, she started apologizing, and we can't do that, Absolutely. and I told her not to feel that way, because she can't do that. Thank you. Well, either that or tell them that I don't see you struggling, I see you with the walker. Well, the thing is, like Christ Jesus did. I mean, he saw the perfect man all the time. Yeah, I mean, and if a person's struggling, wh where is their struggle? Okay. It's in their consciousness, isn't it? It's not in their legs. It's not in their walker. It's, <laughs> I know it's in their view of themselves. Go ahead, Linda. Well, I shouldn't even say anything. <laughs> I wanted to say something. Oh, <laughs> this is a problem I've always had with Plainfield. The only problem is that, um, well, whenever you see that or realize, because you'll never see, that a member is having a problem, well, there's nothing you can do. You can't give them a hug. I mean, you can give them a virtual hug, and I have done that. But it's really alone out here. Well, you're welcome to visit, and we're trying to make it as easy as possible <laughs> to be together as much as possible. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But we never can speak to each other. <laughs> you know, if you came here, you'd get a hug. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long trip from Texas. <laughs> but it's for sure it was a nice hug, though. <laughs> but aren't, Why, aren't, though, no matter how long a trip it is. But aren't you glad that you can dial in and participate? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and, and uh, those of you working, you know, you get to talk to people, the proofers, all, everybody gets more. We, we do encourage it and welcome that. Um, so, and I, I was, also, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say I've also been physically present in churches where you never felt nothing. So exactly. uh, it's not so much. It's all about the thought, I think. Thank you. That's so true. You can be in a physical church and not get the verse of any hug. And I was going to say years ago, I couldn't walk up the stairs of this church, and I was carried up. I was carried up into the into church. Did you feel loved? Boy, did I feel loved. I thought so. <laughs> it never occurred to me that I would stay home and miss a service, so I was carried in. And that's how it should be. Love is the liberator. Love is the heart and soul of Christian science, and no one should ever feel embarrassed about any problem or anything. Only comes up to be healed. And uh, never any condemnation or anything else, ever. Any other answers to question number five? I would just, I will just say, there is no formula. Yeah. But the obligation of each one of us is to do whatever God directs us to do, to help him or her. <laughs> and there is no formula. Most of it is to require unity. Uh, even though some people are willing to love somebody, you gotta be able to open your heart to see that love. But I mean, I have to people in this church who have come back, they withdraw themselves from that hug they're talking about. They don't want to be hugged. <laughs> Even though there are people who are willing to hug them, but they are still not willing to hug them. So you just gonna have to open up your heart for it. Yeah, that's true. Some people aren't used to that. Well, it takes them a little while. Uh, and that's okay. And and, wi and and it takes wisdom to know who wants to be hugged and who doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to hug everybody. We still hug them mentally. That's right. <laughs> yes, we do. As as Jacob said in in the forum, I think he was talking about a, a weak link, and he said, "Well, we will give that weak link a big hug, a, vir a, hug, a virtual hug." Yeah, yeah. And, dear Jacob. and Jeremy, my goodness. He's this great big guy, and he just hugs everybody. So if anybody needs a hug, just come to Plainfield. That's Jeremy. Will. <laughs> and and it's the children. <laughs> yeah, that's a greeting down south. <laughs> yeah. Everybody gets hugged. <laughs> that's it. And also, like Gary said in the end before, sometimes somebody who's having trouble or difficulty following Christ doesn't always show physically. So how can we see it? Because Following Christ is a spiritual, spiritual uh, um, uh, journey, let me put it that way. And for you to see that somebody's having difficulty following Christ, unless you have spiritual, um, you must be equipped spiritually to see it. Even though that person may not notice not that he's actually having trouble. Because I remember an example of myself. There's, a couple of years ago, I was having trouble, and then um, I couldn't speak to anybody about it because I uh, probably maybe was embarrassed about it or something, but it was just so overwhelmed. But physically, it wasn't showing, but <clears throat> underneath, I knew I was having trouble following Christ. And I wish somebody had seen it that time early on, even though I was having trouble speaking up about it. But I, I felt nobody saw it, but I spoke with the, the practitioner at that time, who is not here anymore. I believe he didn't have that speech for, he wasn't spiritually to see that time to see it while we're seeing it, but I spoke to him. I wasn't wake up. I wasn't, I didn't get the help that I needed at that time. He, made, he actually made a case for I spoke to another practitioner who calmed the situation down for me. But it, it was two different things. Um, way of seeing things, but it happened at the same time. One didn't see it, but one saw it. And the one that saw it actually didn't expect it to be too long with me. 
But because she saw it and it helped the situation for me, that was able to break that barrier for me and I was able to walk through it. That's a good point, Benjamin. The, it requires spiritual sense to discern if someone's having difficulty following Christ, if there's no outward manifestation of it. Yeah. That's why we all must have our feelers out and, and to be aware and sensitive. And that's why, you know, to go back to what Gary said, uh, ask what you can do for someone else. If you open up your heart to that, God will tell you maybe there's someone struggling. Get out of yourself. Quit your pity party. Um, and then in helping someone else, you will find your problem gone. It's, it's a, a marvelous. It's the rules and laws of the universe. Unself-love. Well, that was an good. amazing class, Good, Tom. Class. good yeah. session. Thank you. I don't know whether we ever had good talk on you, Adam. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Really well, nice. thank you all, everyone. Thank you, all. Uh, your, your thank, you. thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Tom. Recording stopped. See you all thank tomorrow. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.